All right, so what I kind of hope that you guys got a sense of in this first part is how all your hands are dynamically working together with all your other hands, right? So, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to be prepared for every situation. So when we look back at that um, river and we look back at that turn, you know, like we don't really just want to craft our distribution such that we're perfectly prepared for that one specific river, right? So like looking at the turn, how is it going to affect us if a different card comes, right? So when, when you go back and you read your own hand, you really want to think about how having played this hand in this one way, you don't just kind of want to like overfit your model to the one particular turn or to the one particular turn or river that happened to come, right? You don't want to overfit. So really you want to be, you want to be able to threaten a really wide variety of stuff. That's the idea of the fundamental theorem of chasing. The deeper you are, the more important it is, but as you're less, as you're less deep, as you're more shallow, as long as you have like a couple of hands in the top, you're probably doing pretty well. So the main takeaway here is that if you have more kind of medium hands on the river, you have to call them one, right? Otherwise your opponent can exploit you by just betting a bunch and you having and you folding a bunch of your medium strength hands. So if you want to value bet a lot or if you want to bluff a lot on the river, you have to value bet a lot thinner, right? So if you're gonna be bluffing a ton of your hands, so if you're a really tight player, right, and you might just be value betting like just trips, that's fine. But if you're value betting just trips and then you're bluffing like a ton of hands, like all your bluff hands, that's a disaster, right? So it kind of works both ways. If you want to value bet a lot, or I'm sorry, if you want to bluff a lot, you have to value bet thinly. If you want to value bet a lot, you have to bluff a lot. Um, so generally that's the idea. So kind of moving beyond pure game theory play, right? We'll get to everyone likes to exploit. So um, the game theory idea, when we kind of come back to this idea of playing your distribution against your opponent's distribution, you're not thinking about exploiting in this one sense. You're not thinking about exploiting with your hand against his distribution. You should be thinking, or at least I would argue that you should be thinking about exploiting your distribution versus his distribution. And so kind of what that means is if you think that he bluffs too much, or if he's going to call too much, if you think he's going to bluff too much, you can take these hands here and add a few more of them in, right? So you'll take the marginal folding hands and maybe you'll call with them, right? And so we do this because theoretically, this threshold hand, the very worst hand that you would call with, theoretically, calling in that spot is zero EV, right? And then calling more and more and more you know, or continuing more and more and more gets plus EV, right? So again, like the whole idea of poker from a game theory perspective is that bluffing, right? We make bluffing zero EV. We make our opponents indifferent to, to bluffing by how much we call. So what that means is we get value from the way we've crafted our distribution with our, um, with our value hands. So if we get value from, valuing, from our value hands, like these bluffs are kind of zero EV, and then all the spots at the margins are zero EV, this is worth more, and then zero EV, and then bluff. It, like if you're not bluffing the hands in the bottom of your distribution, that's really bad. So actually, quick, uh, quick rule of thumb. So when I started playing, I played a ton of Limit Hold'em. Um, when I started playing, a uh, really smart guy gave me some, some pretty neat advice, which was when you're at the very bottom of your distribution, you have the worst hand you can possibly have in the spot, always bluff, every single time. And I actually think you guys should try this. So what you find, right, so like these are the hands down here that you just have to be bluffing. Whereas like as the hand gets more and more showdown value, you lose less by not bluffing, right? Make sense? So when I started bluffing all the hands at the very bottom of my distribution, it feels really uncomfortable, right? So like you, you show up and you have whatever, you have six high and the guy has played the hand in such a way that you just know, right? Like you just know he has like top pair, top two pair, he's gonna snap call you. You know it. So you know it, then you bluff anyway and you see what happens. Right, like yeah, a lot of the time he's gonna call you. But you get surprised. I was surprised how often you find a fold. And when you find that fold, it feels so good. Um, 
talking about the limit holdem, right, or more early? Uh, so that's limit holdem, but theoretically, it should apply to no limit as well. But even more of limit, you're better than like if one fifteenth of the clock, just one out of ten holds. So, well, so you're, so not exactly, right? So the smaller the bet, right? So what happens to alpha is the bet is smaller, the guy has to call more and more, right? And the bigger the bluff, the less we have to call. That's why when the guy bets one and a half times the pot, it probably might be right to fold trips. So in that actual hand, I'll talk about that in a second, the actual hand we went through, I actually did fold trips. Um, but yeah, as, <laughs> and so that's another thing, right? It's so like talking about limit, like the guys, people are just gonna call all the time. And the hurdle you have to get past is you have to realize that like, you don't need to be right half the time. Right? You, need to, you, you need him to fold 1 15th of the time or whatever. Um, and these numbers are not natural for us to think about. You know, like we tend to think about things like very categorically, we're good at making differentiations around 50%, but like the difference between 2% and 3% and 4% is really hard, really non-intuitive for us to pick up. So um, yeah, try it, it's fun. <laughs> Bluff the bottom of your distribution. Um, who else we're gonna say? Yeah, okay. And so then obviously like much like this spot here, if they're value betting too much or if they're folding too much, you wanna just if they're gonna fold too much, you wanna add a few more hands to your bluffing distribution. But again, if you wanna do it with the hands that are borderline, right? Um, or if they're value betting too yeah. You guys can point. Um, so as the strength of your read grows, right? We try, to, we try to have different like confidence intervals about our reads. So as the strength of your read grows, you can expand the margins. So if you're like super sure, you can start to fold some really good hands. But you actually have to be super sure. And it's hard to be super sure. So one thing that you can actually do to kind of get a sense of this, um, a game that we'll play in Vegas, I say, call it the Math House. Um, just a bunch of people who like math and <laughs> We go out there for the World Series every summer. So it's like me and Bill Chen, Jared Ankerman, a bunch of other guys. Um, so a game we'll play is called the hand reading game, where basically at the end you try to call the guy's exact two cards. If you get it right, everyone at the table gives you a dollar, or probably more. If you get it wrong, um, you give them a dollar, right? So you're kind of even money, and you have to be pretty confident. But this can, this can kind of like really help you to hone your confidence in these spots. Um, so yeah, as the strength of your read grows, expand from the margins. But you don't want to be thinking, ah, this one time I think he's bluffing. I'm going to call with like, you know, this hand that's like barely a bluff catcher or whatever. You want to be thinking, okay, I'm more confident that he's bluffing. So in these spots, instead of folding fourth pair, I'll call fourth pair and fifth pair, but I'm still not going to call ace high or something like that. So again, thinking across the range of time for, um, for your exploitive plays. So this is what I did in the 4-2 offhand, right? So have you guys done jam or fold yet? Uh, yeah, we did like, yeah, yeah, Okay, so basically you guys did jam or fold. You know like at certain spots, there are times when either you have to go all in or fold, right? And so when you do that, like your distribution is gonna look something like this. So if I had 12 big blinds, you know, I'd guess I'm probably the very bottom of my distribution. The worst hand I'm, hand I'm jamming is maybe king three off or queen three suited. And that's gonna be about even money against just a totally random hand if you enumerate it like on poker stove. Um, so, what I, oh, so what I did was this. I went uh, on the very, very, very bottom of my distribution. and. I was pretty sure about my read, but really like probably what I should have been doing is I should have expanded it down to like here. So it turns out because my opponent didn't look at his cards that running it against a random hand was exactly what it should have been doing. Um, but what I did was that, right? And so like kind of that difference, right? Like 17% of value for, you know, probably $25,000 worth of chips, $20,000 worth of chips is like a lot of money throwing, throwing away, right? So you kind of want a hand that's gonna do a little better in case you're wrong. So again, like the zero EV hands, I don't really care what you do with them. Like if, you, if you're 
folding a hand at zero, if it hands exactly zero EV, if it's exactly a threshold, it doesn't actually matter what, what you do with it. As you get further from the threshold, it matters more and more. Um, so with the example hand that we gave, um, the distribution I showed you probably at the time was actually a pretty good representation of what my distribution was. I might have had like a few more stuff in there, but it was a pretty good representation. But I had a read, right? So um, one thing that I found, being a guy who's known primarily as a limit holding player, is that a lot of the no limit guys think I'm just going to call all the time, right? Because that's what limit players do. We're so used to calling. And if we don't play too much no limit, we come over and, you know, guys end up calling in spots where we have no business calling. So um, when I played that trips hand, I actually had, uh, what the hell, King 10? Yeah, I actually had King 10 in that spot, um, which was right on the borderline. I folded. I still don't know if it's right, but, you know, it's, it's what I did. And I'm, I'm pretty happy with that decision because, again, it, it really was right on my borderline. Um, so, and that's what I do, right? Like, when I get in a really tough spot, when I get in a <laughs> tough spot like that, like, I'm not thinking, so the game theorist, rather than thinking, what does he have? What is his distribution? The question I ask myself is, what is my own distribution? Right? Like, that is the question I ask myself in every tough spot. What hands do I have here? Um, and then... I'll work from there to figure out what I should do. So a um, couple other thoughts. How far are we? Yeah. OK, so a couple other thoughts about exploiting. What did I want to say? Yeah, so don't forget about this part of the equation. You know, so often when we, no, you know what? I want to say one other thing before that. Um, so talking about exploiting at the margins, right, um, with the four deuce hand or with the king ten hand or whatever, that's fine. But again, like the four deuce hand, my read went wrong. Another example um, of how reads can go wrong is we just put like a zero weighting on someone's hand. So actually, uh, a friend of mine, um, Michelle, actually Jared's wife, played this limit hold in hand. She was at Foxwoods, right? And um, I'd kill to be like a woman poker player at Foxwoods, by the way. I feel like you could just like, clean up. Um, so she's a Foxwoods, and she, she opens with pocket aces, four off the button. A uh, guy three bets, and she calls. And the flop comes something like ace, queen, deuce. Uh, she check raises, he calls. The turn comes an eight, she bets, he calls. The river comes a six. She bets, he raises, she re-raises, he re-raises, she raises. He raises, she's like, wait, am I sure that I still have the nuts? They keep going, they put 16 bets in the pot, right? 16 bets in the pot with the pure nuts on the river. Um, to give you an example, we have other toy games that are not worth going through, but really, like, about the region that you should be betting, like, if you're betting 35 or 40% of your hands before the first raise, you should be betting in limit poker, you should be betting that amount squared for the second raise, so you should be then betting like 16%, and the third raise should be that squared, so it should be like 4% or something. So you kind of get closer and closer and closer to the top of your distribution. So after like four raises, maybe five raises, you're at the nuts. So how did he go to 16 raises, right? What he told her was, well, you, you didn't four bet before the flop, so I knew you couldn't have aces, right? So by not putting just like that little possibility that our reads are wrong, um, disasters, can, disasters can happen. So uh, the last kind of little exploitive technique I want to talk about is um, this part of the equation, right? So this is the pot. This is the size of the pot. In, in limit poker, it would be, you know, um, P over P plus one. So the way most of us think about exploiting is kind of via um, frequencies, right? If they fold too much on the river, I want to bet more on the river. Um, if they call too much on the river, I'm going to bluff less on the river. So sort of from a behavioral standpoint, what's happening here is if they fold too much on the river and you bet more on the river and they fold and they lose the pot, we're kind of 
we're teaching them, right? So like if that, if that lose the pot happens right after the betting, um, we're sort of conditioning them, we're punishing them for, for folding more, right? So if we, so one, um, <laughs> that's not really clear. So one thing that a lot of people do, right? They're like if, if they think their opponent folds too much on the river, they just bet all their hands, right? So if you bet 100% of your hands, they're gonna catch on. So we can do something a little sneaky. So for example, um, I played a really long heads up match with a guy once, and we were kind of going back and forth, breaking even, breaking even, and I couldn't figure it out, because it seemed to me like he folded way too much on the turn after we bet before the flop and bet on the flop. Right? It just seemed to me like he folded way too much. And I kind of realized that rather than moving, you know, if I'm betting 80% of my turns, rather than betting 90% of them, I could just make the pot bigger earlier, right? So we're kind of exploiting with downstream, or with our, call it upstream or downstream decisions. So I started three betting a lot more before the flop. So I started making the pot a lot bigger on the flop so that by the time he still gave up on the turn, he's losing more, right? And by kind of like thinking about this in these crafty little upstream or downstream ways, we can um, kind of avoid tipping off um, how we're exploiting our opponents to our opponents. So again, uh, you can adjust frequencies not just at the actual action, but before it. So um, kind of pretty much finishing up here. So again, uh, just in review, like for optimal play, right? First thing we want to do is know our own distribution. <laughs> we want to keep these ratios pretty good, right? Like we want to keep good bluffing to betting ratios. Um, whatever that means, phase and updating. Um, and finally, we want to exploit the margins, right? So if you do all those things, you can avoid being that guy, and you can be that guy instead. Um, so that's actually all I've got. We're a little early here. Any any questions? I, I guess I have to make a question about the, the, the king, jack, eight, five, king, king. So we want to call with 40% of hands that are equivalent to having a king in the ace, king, king, or something like that. Kings are better. So that includes all our aces, too. Yeah, all, all of your aces and enough kings to make it 40% or more. Why is that? So, so what we're doing, right? So if our opponent is betting um, all of his aces and bluffing some amount, right? Like what we're trying to do is, I'll leave that up there. Um, what we're doing, right, is we're setting the we want to call with such a ratio that the amount that he bets, um, like he's he's indifferent to. Let's see if I can yeah, find yeah, this line. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I don't know how to go to slideshow view. Um, so your so your question is, what are we calling it? What's your yeah, or how do we how do we determine what hand not to ping and what hand not to ace? Oh right, okay, yeah, I'm sorry. So. So yeah, at the end of the day, so we can do two things, right? Um, and what I would suggest for reading your own hand is you just pick, like, you pick what is the worst hand that I would bet this amount with on the river, right? Like, what is the worst hand that I would value bet? And that and above, those are going to map your aces. Um, and now, when you pick that, like, 
it doesn't have to be perfect. Like we can we can solve some other games, right? Like there's a zero one game where you can kind of like really like figure out the region, um, but you just want to get it about right. And so what's happening there? Maybe part of your question, right? Is there's this continuous distribution where um, you know some hands. It's not entirely clear what's aces and what's kings, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's, that's yeah. So, so in the long run, what's happening is like we're going to value bet some hands, and we're going to value bet some of our aces, and he's going to call with some of his kings, and we're going to end up losing, right? Like we're going to value bet some hands that we lose, but that works both ways. So he's also going to value bet some hands that he loses in the long run too. So um, for this reason, like the mapping's like it's actually pretty decent, like is as long as we're kind of playing with the right ratios. The mapping is pretty decent. I, I, I know I'm not explaining it well. Does that kind of make sense? I can kind of come up with a better explanation afterwards. But um, yeah, the general idea is that um, kind of because you're betting with regions, and he also doesn't have these discrete hands, right? Like he also has a region. So um, you're playing your region against his region, and the, the aces and kings things kind of evens out. Yeah. Um, good question. Yeah, good question. So uh, what I would say is when you're making the first bluff, right? When you're making the first bluff, you want to bluff with the hands that have no chance at showdown. So it checks to you, right? And you have the, if you have the kings, those kings are just going to win at showdown sometimes. Like maybe they'll beat the queens, maybe they'll, right? So like it checks to you. You have third pair and no one at home. That's going to win at showdown sometimes. Um, whereas, you know, your three high is never, ever going to win. So from an EV perspective, your three high is gaining more EV, right? Because there are more better hands that your bluff can fold out. Um, right? So unless you're thinking that you're going to bluff and get accidentally called by a worse hand, so one, one interesting thing about that, though, is if we look at the ace-king-queen game um, for bluff raising, so you got, what, so actually, what hands do you guys think you should bluff raise with? Any thoughts? Like what hand types? So what hand types you want to bluff, bluff raise with are actually the best hands that you would otherwise fold. And I think maybe that's to your point, right? So like if I'm going to be folding a hand anyway, I can bluff raise with that. And then that strategy dominates the strategy of bluff raising with worst hands. But for your pure bluffing, um, you want to start with the bottom of your distribution because of the, the showdown value thing. So it's, it's, it's a good question and it's kind of an interesting thing. So say it again. Fold immediately. Um, yeah, yeah. So like the um, yes. Uh, so, but however, I would be. I would. I might like three bet like the very. So I have a distribution, right? So I have. We have the bad hands, but we also have the good hands that I've now bet with that weren't bluffs in that same spot, right? And so now I'm going to fold some of those when I get raised. But um, the very best ones that I would fold, those are the ones that I would three that bluff with. Yeah? Um, these considerations, do they change based on our position? On our position or based on the opposite? Sure. Well, so the first way they change, um, I mean, ostensibly you have, you're raising a different distribution from the, from under the gun than you are from the button. So the first way they change is when you're doing your preflop updating, right? So like in my, um, oh, here we go, view. Um, there it is. Right, so like these hands, 
aren't going to be in my distribution if I'm raising under the gun, right? Like I'm still going to have aces, kings, queens, jacks, tens, but I'm not going to have the worst ones here. I'm not going to have the worst ones here. So the idea is the same, but my distribution is going to be very different. Since, since you didn't take into account Um, so, I, it's, it's not obvious because I'm not thinking about his distribution, I'm thinking about my distribution, but I'm thinking about, um, I mean, I am thinking about kind of like what hands, so like always, right, like I'm always value betting the top of my range, I'm always bluffing kind of the bottom of my range, but if my opponent calls from like a different position, so kind of, so the crux of this is that the ace-king-queen game, we and our opponents have symmetrical distributions, right? Like we all have an ace-king and a queen a third of the time. Um, in actual poker, they're not always symmetric, right? So like in actual poker, um, when you raise under the gun the big blind calls, he has a much wider distribution than you, so things that might happen, right? Like when two distributions like that play against each other, the big line is going to have an automatic check and your distribution is usually going to be strong enough that you have an automatic bet. So, yeah, I mean, real poker is hard. Well, so, I mean, if my read is, like, super strong, I mean, yes, I usually don't get reads that strong. Um, but I also think, and I think one of the big misconceptions about game theory is that um, it's, you can't win as much as you do when you play exploitively. You know, and, and that's what a lot of people think, like, oh, well, if you're playing exploitively, like, you're really maximizing yourself against your opponent's distribution. I actually think that's pretty hard. And I've actually found trying to play game theoretically in, certainly at least in limit games, having win rates a lot larger, honestly, than people who don't play in that way. So game theory itself, right? Like the beauty of it is you're crafting this strategy where the very best your opponent can do is break even against you, right? Like the way Jared will explain it, he explains it really well, is you can write down your entire strategy on a piece of paper before you play it, before you start the game. You can give your opponent your entire strategy. Here is what I would do in every single situation. And the very best he can do with that information is break even against you. However, um, when bad things start happening for him, right? Like if he starts folding too much or if he starts calling too much, he, um, he kind of like, they st opponents start to impale themselves on your strategy. So for example, like one thing I've seen all the time, right? Like people will say, oh yeah, you were like, super bluffy, la or like you were tilting last night, you were super bluffy, you were playing way too many hands. And then the next, like an hour later, they'll be like, oh, you've really tightened up. Like you've really like, you know, become a rock. No, I was actually just kind of like at the bottom of my distribution at the beginning of the game. And then I was kind of like <laughs> in the middle or top of my distribution at the end of the game. So people, they read things into the tea leaves and we try to avoid that. And we try to have a strategy that benefits from it. Um, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And that's the whole leveling game that we don't like to play. But um, I think, Will, one other, other thing to, to your point. Um, so, yeah, one, I think, I think balanced play can, can win a lot more than most people realize. Um, and two, what, what's quite nice about it is when you play long sessions, you try to craft nice distributions where you have simple decisions. You know, if you play pure strategies, you have simple decisions, and that means that fatigue doesn't hurt you as much. And this is actually something I think I benefited from a lot when I played online. 
you know, I knew what my strategy was going to be. I knew it. It was no problem. I could play a 20 hour session and at the end of the session, I'm not playing that much worse than at the beginning. Whereas if my opponent is really like thinking really hard about my range and distribution every hand, he's going to fatigue and they're going to play worse. So like, I actually think that like having a simple strategy that I could play is like one of the best things I did for my poker career. Anything else? Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. So if you, if you last three and you get caught, what happens after the flop? Do you, do you, do you think so you continue to last with you? Yeah, I mean, so, um, again, like, I like to think about it. What I should have done for this slide in the second half is I should have just completely removed my hand. Um, so, the way we talk about hands in the house, in the math house, is we'll say, okay, well, I raised preflop, and he called, and then he checked, and I bet, and he called, blah, blah, blah. We give all the action, and then at the end, we'll say, so what are your thresholds here, right? And this is a really cool way to think about it, because it really makes you think about all the hands you might have, and it makes you think about all the threshold, right? It makes you think about, like, the minimum hand you would need to do each thing. So when you ask if you know, I raise preflop and then I bluff and I get called, what would I do? Well, I try to have a balanced distribution. <laughs> you know, like I have a balanced distribution for those times that I raised preflop. So some of those times I'm going to have value, value hands. Some of those times I'm going to have bluffy hands. I'll probably give up on a lot of my bluffs, but I'm going to make sure that I have sequences where I bluff, 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 bluff. You know, um, so kind of liking every sequence to be to be represented. But I mean, in practice, a lot of the time, yeah, you just give up. You know, you take you took your shot and it, it didn't work. Um, I guess that's our time. So if anyone has any other questions, happy to stick around for a few minutes. Uh, thanks, guys. This was a lot of fun.